Okay, great. Uh, okay, I have to stand here, so I'm also part of the Marcus, yes, great. Welcome everyone to our fireside chat of our month April. I'm really delighted to see so many familiar faces as well as new faces joining us today on the topic how to collaborate with a corporate as a tech startup with our guest speaker, Ken Sway, and our host, Ross. Perfect. Uh, if you're joining for the first time and you don't know who we are, what we do, and you've never heard about Startup Grind, we are the world's largest community of startups, founders, and creators, innovators, and a really cool group of like-minded people that is really passionate about entrepreneurs and startups. Our mission is to give startups everywhere the education and opportunity to build, grow, and scale their startups. And we do that through our local events. So you can find Startup Grind in more than 500 chapters and in over 125 countries. If you want to know what else we do, we have a very big global conference every year in Silicon Valley, which has been hosted uh, virtually this year. And we're going to have a second conference called the Europe Conference in London, also virtually if you want to tune in in July. Apart from that, we offer different programs. So we have a startup program that um, connects startups, founders with investors and with, um, with mentors globally. So if you're interested, you can just reach out later to me and um, I can invite you to our different programs. Great, thanks. What I really love about us and what makes us so special are our values. So if you uh, joined our events or if you are here for the first time, we are all about not making conflicts but making friends. We help, we help first before we ask for help and we like to give first rather than taking. So we try to live our values during our events and we hope that you can you know, just reach out to us, talk to us after the event and feel really part of our community. If you want to join any other events, uh, you can find Startup Grind in 20 chapters in all major cities in China. So if you will go to Shanghai, we have an amazing chapter in Shanghai with Eric, our director. Uh, we have a great chapter in Guangzhou as well as in Shenzhen. Feel free to, um, you know, to talk to us and I'm happy to connect you with our chapters in other cities. What to expect? Yeah, we don't only do fireside chats as today with our guest speaker, um, Ken, but we also host workshops, panel discussions. We had a few hackathons uh, before COVID happened. And uh, we also do offline and uh, we do both online and offline. So today we are streaming here. Um, our co-director from Indonesia is helping us to stream the event. And we're, of course, very happy to do it as well in person because not many chapters are fortunate as us and are able to do in-person events. We had a lot of global speakers attending our conference as well as our other chapters. And uh, especially in China, we had a lot of various um, industry leaders joining our events. And this all would be not possible without an amazing team of volunteers. So if you wonder, we are all volunteers um, helping out to get these events together to host events, to be an active community. And we have on the next slide, our great leaders. So Kaha, the guy who will be waving right now in the back, is our chapter director. And Maddie is supporting us right now from Indonesia and helping with the streaming. Then we have a few different teams that are supporting us. The community team with Sabrina, she's also here in the black hoodie. We have the event team, the marketing team, we have a very small university team, so if you're interested in starting a university chapter, just talk to us and we can help you to um, launch a university chapter at the university. And a big thank you goes to all of our community partners. Without them, we wouldn't be able to bring um, you know, different communities together and host uh, these amazing events with um, the promotion they also help us to do. All right, uh, on the next slide, you can find our QR code. So if you are not subscribed to our WeChat account yet, please do that and you will get all the updates and we'll be always in front of our upcoming events. Now I would like to give a big round of applause to our speaker, Ken. So first of all, I would like to say a big thank you from our side, from the team, and I, I can say for sure from audience side, we are really grateful to have you here tonight. And, and uh, yeah, I think that gets started. And uh, previously, I was checking your experience and background, and I was quite surprised to see the like the diverse background that you have. You grew up in Japan, then you moved to China back, and then you studied in Singapore, 
in large a lot of things, but how have they actually landed in the automotive industry? It was a specific focus on the innovations. Ah, long story. <laughs> so uh, before that, uh, I have one to share to everyone today. So this is my second time to come to the uh, Startup Grind Fireside Chat. The last time was in 2019, I remember. Uh, that time I represented Dapner as a company employee. But today I'm surely come as an individual uh, myself. So not standing for Moje Digital China or Moje affiliate companies. So please don't call me <laughs> to any social uh, distribution. So, okay, let's jump into the major topic. Um, so how I landed into automotive uh, innovation part. Uh, actually, I started my professional career in FMCG uh, industries. So I sell beverages. <laughs> I sell beverages. It's a coconut water, American coconut water brand, uh, which uh, were in 2014, wanted to uh, enter China market. So I started as a marketing manager, branding manager, uh, you know, for young professions, uh, events, marketing, sponsorship is always excited. So that's my first period of professional works. But uh, coincidentally, uh, I learned HMI design in Tsinghua University back in 2010. So in that time, it's very, very well people really uh, studying this industry and knowing what is user experience, what is human machine interactive. So by 2016, I got a chance from my old fellow from old fellow from Tsinghua University. He already joined that group. Said, okay, uh, Daimler is doing innovation, shaping the future. Uh, so, will you join us to do something just like we did in the laboratory back to Tsinghua? I said, okay, that's cool. I already get, get sick of marketing and branding, so I want to grow up. So, it's a very, very coincident uh, chance for myself to jump into the automotive industry. So, the first uh, role for me in uh, automotive was a product owner, or, or let's say you can understand it like a product developer uh, or product designer for that. But only one or two cases, my boss and my superiors find out compared to develop products, I'm more better um, developing the networks, like communities, startup raising, the tech giant. So they gave me a huge uh, how to say, assessment, said, can build up the innovation networks for us in China, in China for China. So that's why I took the challenge from end of 2016, uh, I kind of, the, uh, the startup guy inside that group. So in China, in China. So that's how I jump into the automotive innovation area. And recently you were starting actually working this portion, right? Yeah, just, 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 yeah, just okay. this month. Okay, cool. So am I right that Previously, you were mostly scalping startups, right? And specific focus on gaining startups and corporate. And um, I would like to know, for example, as a sculptor, um, uh, you search for thousands of startups, but how can you actually have the feeling of a certain startup in it? How do you know? You mean, the, uh, yeah, I search. Search. yeah, okay, they for corporate and uh, the corporate is a certain startup. Yeah, uh, from corporate side, uh, uh, one add up. So I'm not only worked for corporate for the past few years, uh, I also worked for startup. <laughs> so I, I was in, in person to jump into startup work, to be a startup middle management person uh, in time sharing mobility business. So it's a brutal business, <laughs> you know, every day, if the, the revenue doesn't exceed or doesn't reach the certain level, that means the next day we have to lay off people. So I have two perspectives, uh, not only corporate side, also the startup side. Uh, but this question is more from corporate perspective, right? So how we choose the right startup? Uh, first of all, of course, uh, from corporate side, corporate should initiate the requirement first. Uh, uh, that will have a lot of channels, more like a company-wide or enterprise-wide cultural events, like encourage every colleagues to came up their own idea and through the, the check gates to, to 
upgrade it to uh, promising ideas. Then with this idea, that means corporate needs someone to help to really build up this idea or realize this idea. So, so every idea or requirements should start from corporate internally. Uh -huh. So let's deep dive into uh, uh, one case. So with this idea, sometimes the idea is much more focused on business side uh, and it's highly relevant to core business of a corporate. Uh, but startup is more focused on their own business or sometimes they focus on their technology or if it's an earlier stage startup, they more focus on people and the team. So there is a huge gap between the real demand and the real supply. So in the middle layer, me and my previous team became the translator or navigator to make it in this. So yeah, how we define this is the right startup. First, they have to have the potential solution for this requirement. That's uh, rule number one. But the second thing, or to, for the rest of things, we more focus on people. So working with corporate is a hard job, uh, uh, long time, <laughs> long time communication. So startups should have uh, first patient, uh, patient, be also the, I would say, the, 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 the sustainable or consistent, yeah, consistent motion to dealing with these complexities. So the people, especially the founder and the core team, they are very, very important. Uh, that they can get along with this long process. So first A, the technology, the solution, the service, the product should potentially match this requirement, but B, it's all about people. So as long as I have an idea, but I, for example, if I don't have people, but I have an idea, can it be considerable by the corporate? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's not yeah. Okay, but from like, Besides all of these things, um, we would probably know that um, most of the startups, they want to invest in, right? Um, is there any other things that actually should be, like a uh, founder should focus on besides the investment to, to provide to corporate, as you just mentioned, for example, the team, or maybe like mm, the solution, right? Uh, anything else besides that? Or is only these two main ingredients actually make you successful, right? Mm. Uh, because of my experience and my practice, I always focus on the earlier stage startups. That means all be before you run Series D. Uh, so I'm not sure how corporate investment team working like a merger and acquisition, they more look into the, the later stage. But from my knowledge, working with earlier stage startups, uh, they are quite less of, I would say, uh, corporate function related stuff like legal risk management, uh, and, uh, IP. Uh, those are stuff uh, that really drags the, the, the time uh, and also misunderstanding each other. So, uh, that's something one tips for smart founders. If you are earlier stage startup and you got a chance to work with corporate, then make sure your foundation, your corporate functions are stable uh, um, 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 on people. <laughs> so that's one tip. And uh, secondly, I've, I, I face this, uh, several cases that startup technology is promising, the people are really matching, uh, and the potential projects are there, but startup cannot grab it. Why? Because they're, let's say, the product, productivity or the production uh, capacity cannot match what corporate really needs. Uh, especially in the automotive industry, that means one commercial contract uh, requires very longer period of capital, uh, capital, uh, in, in, in capital injection, and also you have you also need to have a very, very stable and uh, sustainable supply chain to provide products to the corporate. But a lot of startups, at least in early stages, they cannot meet this requirement. So it means millions more, uh, or hundred millions, sometimes hundred millions, <laughs> order is there, but you cannot grab it. Uh, it's very big, very big. Uh, but maybe 
direct direct collaboration uh, or the design of direct collaboration is corporate. For startup, you can also build up your I would say partnership chain to tier one, tier two, or tier three to be one of them. So under their umbrella, they can provide you the, the very sustainable supply chain. So that's two tips uh, for startup who are working with corporate in the future. Okay, but this is a more mostly I would say double tips. But for example, is I'm a early stage startup. Okay, I know about the things. Um, let's say I'm a promising startup, right? And I'm a cool guy. And I don't have an idea, but I don't have the money and say for that. How should I attract um, company expansion to me? Could you give us some tips, like from the field, practical tips, like how to attract the company, so like their attention, where should I go, or who should I talk to, mm. or something like that? Yeah. Mm. Of course, there are many, many ways to approach to corporate, but corporate is huge. <laughs> how to find the right people, that's really, really difficult. Uh, so, uh, how to say? Luckily, if you get some brothers or, or insiders, that's good. He or she can ask around, say, who might will be the right interface or be the person to get into the right business line. So build up your buddies inside corporate, that's one. <laughs> and also participate more and more event-based, uh, event-based, let's say, accelerator or open day or something, to be bold on that. Uh, because that's a different scenario uh, for the corporate side. If you want to see senior management, it's really, really hard. Even for employee level, it's really, really hard. But once you talk to, uh, once the innovation day or open day happens, every senior management gather around, gather together to one day, one space, one time. So be bold to, to apply for that open day, get a one booth. Get all the marketing materials ready and go to talk to the, the biggest guy. I think that's one way, one quick path for startup to get attention. Uh -huh. But of course, after the event, it's like the after the party, uh, you have to have the strategy of how to follow up and how to stick on that potential highly interested topics. So again, back to build up your body inside corporate. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so it's all about network, right? Network, yeah. Okay, no. Oh, let's say I know. Uh, to participate more and more startup grant. That's good, man. Right? <laughs> it's a good place. Okay. Uh, yeah. But let's say I'm still a cool guy and I have my idea, but I'm not in China and I want to actually. As you, as an expert, actually, of bringing startups to this area, is your experience with coconut water, right? Um, what are the main um, problems that actually face by startups entering the market? And uh, yeah, you mean a foreign, yeah, foreign, 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 foreign China, 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 just landing a brand to China. Uh, I will share first about my perspective in corporate side, how to land a new brand to China market. Okay. Then I will share about how to, uh, I have a new business or I have a, a proven business case. I want to enter in China. So first from corporate side, I landed one coconut water brand and also one program brand. Uh, so the biggest challenge for me is, I would say, Registration limited <laughs> So, so uh, for beverage, you know, the customer office, uh, the company registration trademark stuff, uh, it proves that in other markets, doesn't mean you are, uh, I would say, legally in China. So, registration will be my first headache. Then, talk about business side, the strategy always will be the biggest challenge. Sometimes you think one business model works in investment market, like subscription, uh, like uh, membership related business model, but it's not gonna happen in China, not gonna happen. So you have to change the business model, like change your subscription subscription model into kind of a 
child or three months, then you got a small payment on that. So the business model adjustment is also a very important part in strategy repositioning for China market. Then come to, okay, talk about what, what can be a uh, keep uh, for brand lending in China. I think the brand GBA or brand gene and brand story should be 100% keep. Uh, but for the China strategy and the go-to-market strategy, especially the, the sales-related channel, partnership, pricing, everything should be changed. We reposition for that. So that's too challenging for me when I work for corporate to lend it to a brand in China. Mm -hmm. But also talking from startup itself, mm -hmm. if I prove myself, no matter it's an IoT product or it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a digital service, I want to prove it in other market. I want to jump into China. Uh, I think firstly, you have to find the right partner. The partner here sometimes means will be your real co-founder for China. Uh, still, China has a re restraints for uh, foreign registration in China. So find the right partner who you trust and who understands the core value of the business and who can maintain the brand image in China market. Find the right person. Uh, then for the rest, I, I think it will be the same, like right market strategy, go to market, pricing channel, customer related stuff. Um, yeah, partner will be the key priority. Mm -hmm. All about people. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will really just put them away for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a partner. Uh, how should I get the feeling what is what is going to work in China? Um, being not here, actually. Is there any chance without coming here and just checking on the bill? What do you suggest in this case? For both, for both sides, the corporate and <laughs> for corporate employee, I won't help. <laughs> for startups, uh, for startup perspective, I must say, uh, if it's a promising business model, which I can see the potential, and my resources can really, I say, make things happen, okay, I will try to be the founder. But uh, this is all how to say hypothesis. So I think the right way is go to Smarin <laughs> or go to uh, uh, go to Kata team, like uh, they are official channel for foreign companies to jump into China, right? So for corporate side and for smart founder in China, I don't think they are the first choice when you have an idea one come to China. Okay, then slowly going back to China. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still here and I'm a startup, I'm kind of a lucky guy, so I definitely corporate collaboration. And um, if by chance that my idea is actually skyrocketing, but I'm still under the roof of the corporate, is there any chance that I can become independent again? And for example, go to initial public offering, or I can do so, uh, even remaining under this like, roof of, uh, of the corporate. Um, I also had a talk with one of my friends who is leading the the, the corporate CDC uh, and also the innovation branch in very famous cosmetic company. Uh, last week I talked to her and she said in her industry, uh, sometimes startup really define the future. So uh, like a new product or new brand uh, or new IoT stuff, really defining the, the cosmetic future. So my feeling is maybe for fast, consuming industry, like food, the beverage, cosmetic, daily use stuff, uh, sometimes startup can be, uh, define the, 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 the future of the whole industry. But for, at least for my industry, uh, which area, automotive, uh, industrial, uh, manufacture, and also mobility related, the barrier is very, very high, uh, very, very high. So if you are a startup willing to jump into automotive industry, I think better uh, or the best strategy will be stick to one big player. Uh, try to make this big player become your big brother <laughs> to, to take you into the industry and show off, or not say show off, it's like a showcase to the entire, the entire industry and say, this is the right guys, this is the right technology, this is the promising product. Then with one successful uh, example, then 
your solution, your product, your service, your company will be duplicated to the entire, entire industry. I think that's my otherwise. But only for automotive industry. Uh, but in case, for example, if I, yeah. uh, in case if I mm, kind of stick to one, not really a big player, but average one, I would say, and later, I still want, I'm still gonna, um, should I be ready to say goodbye to my idea? Because it actually was, in, was invested by that company and its automotive industry, or I, there is a way I can actually take my idea and become independent again and go for other um, solutions and options that I can actually take. Uh, for automotive industry, I wouldn't suggest to jump too frequently. <laughs> Because this industry, let's say manufacturing industry, is proven for more than hundred years. Uh, that's how car built, and that's how, how, how car sells. And uh, the industry itself, the giant player itself, themselves, already shaping their new futures. So that means this industry is very active and dynamic now. That means also the big gaps inside it. So as the promising startup, uh, once you have a good team or you have a good technology, you should stick to on this industry. Uh, if you want to do this thing, uh, do, the, do the automotive industry, stick on it. And then at least try to stay three to five years. Uh, that's one iteration, at least one iteration for new car product launching. Uh, so stick one iteration, then you will see your chance. Uh, that's from automotive industry perspective. Uh, but maybe for cosmetic, for food and health, uh, that's a different story. Uh, but for automotive, should stick and try to stick under one huge shelter. Uh, uh, the, the, the shelter itself will have different production, uh, sorry, different business lines. That means huge opportunities. But once you have a let's say AI, I have AI, <laughs> AI technology, or, or more deep dive into it. I have a good data architecture and a data, uh, how say, data algorithm, then stick on that technology, try to find more and more use cases in production, design, R&D, and also sales, uh, insurance, or financial services. Your technology can be duplicated to only one partner. The entire system we can duplicate it to their different business lines. Yeah, stick it, stick to it. Mm -hmm. But so maybe you know in which cases I should really consider and stick on the company. What could be the markers or criteria that I should um, have a look at to understand this is not my story? I would say. Do, do you have any? That's very specific, but generally from uh, uh, OEM side, uh, the game also is, uh, is also changing now. Uh, you know, the new OEMs, uh, electric uh, new powers. So they're already disrupting the entire uh, industry from the past 100 years. So it's a big wave. Just get on board that wave and then to be a good sufferer, uh, no, sorry, server, 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 right? then you will get huge opportunities. Um, uh, but if you ask me what will be the particular case, uh, I think the customer facing side uh, will be the huge uh, blue ocean for the newcomers who want to join to automotive industry. Uh, think about this. Uh, the traditional OEM or traditional automotive industry is a uh, wholesale business model. That means they never directly talk to customer. But the new automotive uh, model, which happened in the past 15 years, that means getting more and more closer to customer. And the cost, increasing the customer engagement, creating the extension business model to customer, right? And get the customer satisfaction, uh, extreme customer experience, everything is about customer. That means this is the lack part uh, or weakness part for traditional OEM. 
So if you can do a customer facing new business, at least in the automotive industry, just jump on this wave and to be a good surfer, I think you will be success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, then the next question would be, um, usually decisions about partnership aren't made overnight, right? So let's just imagine you're a corporate and a startup um, and we are about to get into partnership, but it's still not yet done. Uh, how, should, how much time should I plan to leave this uncertainty actually before the decision is made? Because sometimes it might take months or even half a year. It depends on the case, right? But maybe there is an average time that the startup should be ready to survive by himself, for example, before actually the decision is made. Again, back to patient. Patient sometimes means uh, mentally patient, also means uh, physically patient. That means you, you should have a very stable uh, operation, operation to keep you can keep engage with corporate. At least from my knowledge, uh, we're creating very fantastic acceleration program, but it also takes hundred days to really get from idea to, to something tangible, right? That's 100 days. Uh, before 100 days, also another 100 days to, to scouting, to filtering. That means in total, seven months passed. Then after seven months, if you are success, that means you can got a small order to trial. Uh, so working with automotive giants still is a is huge challenge. Uh, for for a too early stage startup, uh, but if you are confident in that, uh, the return will be also huge. Uh, it's a long term supplier contract, and your technology, your product will be the you know first ever showcase on the automotive industry. I think that's uh, let's say deserve it. Deserve for the patient. Deserve for the lady. Uh, Okay, um, maybe then from the corporate perspective or startup one, either way, um, what are the trends that you can actually foresee for coming years? Uh, again, either from general industry or the automotive industry for startups and for corporates in terms of partnership and future innovative and disruptive ideas. You mean the big market trend, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Before our session uh, started, I also talked to Mara. I think a lot of Mara, a lot of people ignore that uh, China has a huge consuming power. Is in, uh, is is is, uh, is uh, generating now? Uh, you know, in the past ten years, people always focus on the the Jiuling Hou, the younger generation that uh, they have a uh, insane consuming power. Uh, but does anyone know? By 2030, how many elderly person in China will be increased? Does anyone know? Just guess. Okay. 700 million. 700 million. That's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a 132 million elder person, means 55 years old above, will be increased by 2030, just nine years to go. That means entire Japan market, entire France plus German market, entire Nordic, Sweden, Norway, and uh, Denmark, and uh, um, um, Finland plus together. So this is a huge market. Uh, so nowadays, a lot of people only focus on Gen Z or younger generation. From my perspective, I think elder person uh, or more mature consuming power. That's the biggest trend uh, for myself. And back to our industry, the automotive industry, I think, um, of course, the car market in China is, is still good, very good. It's, even last year, it's very, very good for premium sectors. Um, but for the entire movement, I think aftermarket and used the car market, uh, will be, uh, I would say, fast-growing sectors. Uh, that's not the traditional territory for OEMs and not for the automotive uh, giant players. 
that's all defined by market itself. Uh, it's very, very tapping to local area. Uh, so I, I share two trends. Uh, one is generally from the China market, which I feel the, 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 the elderly person market will be the huge, huge, huge potential. And for my industry, I think aftermarket and used to car market will be the huge market. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's say, um, yeah, I'll just sum it up a little bit um, from your perspective, again, from corporate and startup on, um, what can be two, three main startup features that actually um, stand out most to corporate, besides the ones you mentioned before, any others, is actually also crucial and important, but most of the time they're underestimated. Okay, I will give very practical tips to startups, okay? A, uh, get familiar with Outlook system, how to send in the invitation, how to block your share times, how to send a proper email. I think this is tip A. Huh? And B, uh, make sure your company, uh, I mean, the legal entity it, it, uh, itself, um, will be matched for startup, uh, sorry, will match for corporate procurement process. Uh, that means the registration years and your, your, your shareholding structure or something. So make sure uh, you will be matched on that procurement process. The three, still people. Try get to, to get set up your buddies, to set up your navigation channels inside corporate. The people always bring the new possibilities. Yeah, the three practical tips. Then I just come up with a question. Uh, you mentioned about people, right? This is really important for in terms of being sexy enough in front of the corporate, right? But if I have a really cool idea, but I don't have people, can I expect that the corporate can support me in this term or not? Um, this comes to eight principle. So keep 20% hope to rely on some nice guy from corporate will identify me. That's only keep 20%. But 80% try to disrupt this. Uh, if you stick on that, believe in that, and uh, you, you, you're getting longer enough to, to stay in this uh, development, then I think one day you will break through or disrupt the traditional industry. So only keep 10% hope. 80% on, on self, you know, depends on self. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, don't have, I don't have a team by now, let's say, but my idea is really something cool. Um, and I'm about to get a partnership with corporate. Should I expect, or can I expect corporate to provide me some people to support this idea to develop it? Um, yeah, that was my question. <laughs> to be very honest, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Good, yeah, you have to at least have a company, uh, have a team, have a proven uh, product, service, and solutions. That's how you can really attract corporate. Uh, but for the Android investors, I think that's the first station you should go. Okay, I think um, that's that's all for for tonight between each between us actually. And now we can actually start with the Q and A session. And for those who have questions, I would like to ask to be more specific and close to the point. And then, if you have questions, please raise your hand. And our yeah. it's not actually a question, but I've, I've been in the investment world for about thirty years. And I think the most important thing that you can do as a team when you're going to work to a corporate, so you gotta do your homework, you gotta really do your due diligence, you gotta know every single person within that organization and so much about them so that you can actually get in there and, and speak with them. So you gotta you really gotta do your due diligence. It's so so important. And then you have that, then you can relate to them, then you can get a warm lead. And then you have to have you get one chance once once you got when you get in there. You gotta like just go at it and, and be very diligent and follow up and don't say no. And thank you so much for the fire session. Um, 
I have some friends working actually for big uh, German automotive companies, um, and they do startup scouting for these companies. And secretly, they call it killing startups and killing innovation. Because they say, as soon this huge bureaucracy, these structures, these rules, and this long time for everything is kind of killing every innovation. Would you agree or disagree in why with this statement? I don't agree. <laughs> Maybe for other industry, I think uh, this working mechanism will kill the real power. But at least in automotive manufacturing industry, I think that needs the big brothers. Uh, setting the rules, setting the, uh, the, the reason uh, and the pace. Uh, car is very much care about uh, safety. So any urgency creation or any urgency innovation doesn't match with this uh, final goal. Uh, so if uh, talking about German automotive will work. Uh, so that's my answer. In the last Hi, thank you. Um, so if you're a startup uh, signing a partnership with a big corporate and you see that they have some staff with expertise that can help you like legal or marketing or, or product knowledge, um, I mean, those guys have already got their regular salary and regular work and you're coming in and suggesting dumping more work on them. Do you have any strategy, strategies to motivate them to help you, or would you say just don't, don't even try that? <laughs> Thank you. So if I'm facing a, a, a growing, fast-growing startup, and if they focus on production or manufacture itself, I would say um, try to save your time. <laughs> because <laughs> a lot of giants uh, are way better on this. But if you are tapping to local market, to know the local customers. You got a data, you got a user pool, and you got you got a unique solution how to keep engagement. I think you will be the king. Uh, the relationship will be reversed. Uh, the, the OEM side will be begging you to say, let's work together, let's try out, co-create a new business together. Yeah, um, for the people online, the first question would be, um, can you recommend any online sources uh, between collaboration uh, of corporate and startups? Okay, sorry. Um, any online resources can be recommended from your side between corporate and startups in terms of collaboration? Online sources. Online sources. Online sources. Yeah, that's the question. Any online sources? Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> But if you're working with a corporate, really, to dig out the background, context, and the history of the brand, yeah. that sometimes really helps, really helps. And you can extract the core essential of the, the only step, the brand extension. Uh, and the brand, let's say, relocalization to China, in China for China. So Wikipedia, <laughs> if it's an online core or online platform, I would say the knowledge based on that. Okay. And uh, also another question from the Zoom. Uh, is the policy changes to traditional vehicles uh, and the introductions of electronic vehicles, how support should work time there uh, in a way to cope with the market uh, or policy demands? Is there a, in what areas can startups collaborate with push? Or another? Uh, Cannot answer this question. <laughs> I'm not standing for my company today. But about that? I'm a meta company. <laughs> yeah, so I will share it by individually. Again, the customer facing, the market specific facing product, service, and solution will be your killing features to knock knock the corporate doors. Uh, so try to get your at least your own customer base uh, or customer data, customer analysis, then that's something corporate one partnership with you, not by you or not just uh, uh, set up as you set, set up you as a vendor. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. Oh, there is a dog. Okay. It's also from Sarah Bryan. Uh, but actually, the question was a little bit different. Um, in which areas can startup collaborate with a big corporate, let's say, climate? AI, I don't know, connectivity, something like that. Maybe from your perspective, actually, it's more wide than I know, for example. Because I know the recent trends are on AI or connectivity or uh, new new energy vehicles and stuff like that. Maybe from your side, can give some more. Action. AI is too wide. Uh, let's say if we divided AI to specific area, I have to say nature language processing, NLP, uh, for specific market use, uh, specific uh, China use cases, will be your fast track to working with big corporate. No matter it's automotive or other, because anyway, the, the corporates will check themselves into a digital company. So how to understand better the, the, the voice, the, 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 the feedbacks online, and the uh, sentiment, no, sorry. To, to give the right feedback by machine to help you. I think AI should focus on that part. Uh, that's my personal feeling, I'm not AI expert. Uh, and uh, for our industry, of course, connectivity is the huge topic. Uh, but if we divide it into uh, a specific area, I think IoT will be the right uh, field. IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, why I say that? Because China is the biggest IoT country in the world. And the, 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 how to say, the huge capacity on delivering the, any kind of IoT. So you're already in this market. Why you don't leverage these resources? Uh, so I would say IoT uh, will be also the right. This is AIoT, AIoT. Yes, put AI together and IoT, <laughs> AI OT will be the right uh, field tap into that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, I think that's all. Oh, another question. Thank you. Um, I have a question from a startup perspective. So, woo -hoo -hoo. okay, <laughs> allergic to you guys. Okay, um, I have a question regarding like from what, because we mentioned there are a certain hierarchies, you know, when I, when we collaborate for startup with a corporate from a startup perspective. So from a startup perspective, what are the, can I say, what should I look for when I want to collaborate with a corporate? What are the things that I should pay attention or that are beneficial for me and for my startup? It doesn't have to be necessarily automotive, but like what should I look for when I want, when I'm considering to co collaborate with a corporate? Oops. Very nice question. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, actually, I, I really want to answer this question because with my one year experience in startup, the mobility startup, I also joined a lot of roadshow events which held by automotive giants, uh, including the German companies. <laughs> so I set up booths, you know, I bring the team to showcase, to play the video, to send out the brochures. To sell myself, but only one goal behind: get the contract. Uh, get the contract. A startup side, get the contract. What kind of? I don't care what kind of contract, but get the contract from corporate. Then that makes something different. Uh, with the contract from corporate means at least it's very very on trend uh, research area or on trend. Uh, technology development area that's from uh, corporate side, they, are, they can define the trend, right? Or, in the other hand, the contract also means, uh, at least in that time, my, my company, the startup, didn't have had any automotive giant as a client to establish any kind of uh, corporation. So, for me, I will be the first guy, first team to set up startup corporate partnership. So the only goal for me and my team is to get the contract, no matter what. Am I answering the right question to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of in a way of uh, just get the contract, <laughs> but also like, you know, when, I, when I'm like 
I don't know if there really benefit a lot of benefits to collaborating with corporates. So I'm still like considering and waiting out the pros and cons. And then you know, I wanna, I wanna be, I'm picky. You know, I have a great startup. You know, so I'm picky. So you know, what are the things that I, you know, when I can choose to pick corporates, what are the things that I should come start with? Hmm. Hard question. <laughs> I would say if uh, it's already good enough, it will be chosen by no matter corporate or venture capitals, uh, and you will be busy enough, has no time to think about this TV stuff. <laughs> so, uh, still back to our dialogue before, I don't think earlier stage startup is the right approach to corporate side. Corporate don't have the vision, they want a stable and uh, and a mature supply from from startup side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I just have a question that I'm really curious about because you just mentioned about you come from the automotive industry, and in the past, uh, normally, uh, you know, for the brands, they have the wholesalers. To sell the cars, and nowadays it's going to be the direct sales. So, uh, because I come from a, a, a industry, a uh, home furniture industry, which is quite similar to the situation in for the automotive uh, industry in the past, because either it has got the uh, factory directly to the customers, or it has got all the distributors. Um, uh, I'm just curious about. What's, what's the insight about the business model adjustment? Uh, I, I know this customer by behavior changed, but uh, do you have any ideas about the insight? Why it changed? Because um, now I'm actually in a new project, in a tech, uh, technology startup, and uh, I need to figure out whether to invest more resource, um, direct factory, this kind of model, and the companies all, we need to invest more resource on the partners they are distributors. So I'm curious about what's your opinion. Thanks. Yeah, understand. Uh, it's uh, definitely from pro professionals uh, question. But uh, one thing to, to, to emphasize, I don't think the direct sale is uh, is is for for the uh, how to say. The wholesale is the traditional model, but I didn't say the direct sale will be the future. But just several new companies, they try direct sale and it looks quite well. Okay, so don't mistake me. Still in our industry, the wholesale will be the foundation. Uh, not gonna change uh, for at least decades. Uh, but you're asking me for the insights, uh, why it's changing? Um, Never thought about it, but when you ask it, I think the the how to say the cost of trust people is uh, how to say is dumb. Dropping, dropping, just dropping. Yeah, just the charge of the money. 就是信任成本在降低。信任成本在降低了以后，就意味着可能通过经商体系，它的责任链、利益链，还有这种信任的这种连接，不需要这么复杂了。我们的认证、验证，对吧？包括。Okay, okay. So I think the cost of trust each other, uh, is become more convenient. So that's why it it creates possibility that. Uh, the direct contact or direct engage will be increasing. That's my personal insight. Uh, I will think more deeply on this topic. Maybe next time we can discuss more. Have you thought about COVID-19 and how that's changed? It? Because there's a lot of direct-to-consumer tapping on factories because people couldn't travel. That's all of my knowledge. <laughs> yeah. That's too wide, too wide. Okay, I think that's one last question, okay? This is gonna be the last. Thank you.
who gave me the best chance to that's a question so because i i currently i work in a job company so uh, actually i am kind of a startup in china but it's not a purely a startup because i just uh, uh, start to uh, start to set up the China, China subsidiary recently. So everyone is a start to zero to one. And uh, so my uh, trouble is, and uh, so in China we have a lot of opportunity to cooperate with different company. Uh, but normally the company in China, they are uh, living in a very fast pace, but the, the European company is quite good, is, is very slow. So, uh, I think the response to the corporate uh, proposal is quite slow. So do you face this kind of zero uh, problem and how to uh, solve it, uh, in your opinion? Uh, you extract the question? The question is, and, uh, in China, if you want to cooperate with other companies, so normally the overall negotiation and the process is quite, quite fast. But in Europe, it's quite slow. So because not they will spend uh, uh, around one year to to uh, negotiate and also evaluate if it's worth to cooperate or not. But in China, so it's uh, only the company cannot wait so much long time. So uh, do you face this kind of similar problem in your uh, experience? So how to solve it? I think that's my advantage. So to working in China market, uh, from the entire segment, uh, China already become a lot of the biggest single market in the world, right? So that means uh, our headquarters should follow the local people's suggestion. So that's my advantage. I never headache on that. I always appreciate that. Uh, so I will create a, uh, how to say, create the, the urgency from outside, say, hey, our partners online, uh, uh, in the line, right? Our contract is pending, so let's move faster. Otherwise, we will lose the opportunity. So that's my advantage. Okay, thank you for all the answers and for sharing your experience from both directions, from startup, from corporate, and now we're gonna slowly move to networking part. So I think people, if you have questions, you can still talk to Ken. I think you're gonna leave it the moment. And please enjoy the, the slice of pizza and beer. And let's start our networking. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah.